human spirit is both what's left when everything is stripped away and at the same time, the sum total of all our parts, body, mind, and spirit, and everything that makes us up. I am only going to skim the surface of everything I mentioned this morning. A lot. But not all that I have to say is going to come out of a Christian theological framework, mostly because that's what I have the training and language for, but it also applies to many other traditions in as much as the content of what I'm going to be saying. Because it's not about doctrine, which we don't have, but about the ways in which people feel or don't feel, express and don't express something called spiritual. I am hoping to explore some of the things I touch on much more deeply as Sunday services and sermons of their own next year and as time goes on. <clears throat> so first of all, a couple of working definitions might help. And these are mine and things I find useful. Your mileage may vary. In order to contemplate spirituality, it helps to know what we're talking about when we use the word spirituality. So it is spirituality I'll focus on, but not necessarily religion, although that will come into it a bit. I personally do not care for the term spiritual, but not religious, as much as I prefer being spiritual and religious. I believe you can be spiritual in isolation as an individual and also with a community, but I think being religious requires a community. Even if someone lights a Sabbath candle or prays a rosary or faces Mecca and prays by themselves, in so doing, they are connected to a community and a history and a tradition. So even isolated individual practices are part of a community of practice. That's the way I think of it anyway. So spirituality has to do with spirit. And a lot of people tend to think automatically of divine spirit, which may be God or goddess or Holy Spirit or spirit of life, but I think can also be, from my perspective, just the human spirit. And for me, all of these are terms that describe an ineffable essence. I want to start with some traditional Jewish and Christian concepts. My definition of spirit and spirituality divorces itself from a concept of an anthropomorphic, all-powerful personal deity, although the Christian and Jewish traditions necessarily do not. The term spirit in Jewish and Christian tradition is related to the Spirit of God in those traditions, and in Christianity, to the Holy Spirit, theologically. But just the word spirit we have in English is a fascinating translation of Hebrew and Greek. In Hebrew, it's ruach. My Hebrew is not great, so ruach. And in Greek, it's pneuma, pneumology, pneumatic. And interestingly enough, when these words are used, they are used about something that translates to breath, wind, air. Elizabeth Johnson, in her 1992 masterwork of systematic theology called She Who Is, says when the Bible talks about spirit, it literally means a blowing wind, a storm, a stream of air, breath in motion, something dynamic in movement and impossible to pin down. And it points in the Jewish and Christian traditions to a livingness, a liveness of God, of a divine spirit that creates, sustains, and guides all things and cannot be confined in any way. That's a lot to pack into a word, spirit. But it's also part of what I think our Christian tradition that many of us learned at one point or another somewhere lost as being packed into that word. 
she specifically points out that the divine spirit is not understood as an anthropomorphically personal spirit of God, but rather as a, quote, the creative and freeing power of the divine let loose in the world. I like that. Following Johnson, Marcus Borg, in his 1997 book, The God We Never Knew, he's got great titles, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, Reading the Bible Again for the First Time, The God We Never Knew. He has a very liberal slant on things. He says, in the Bible, quote, spirit is used comprehensively to refer to God's presence and creation in the history of the community of Israel in the life of the early Christian church. Its meaning is sufficiently broad to make it a synonym for the sacred or the divine. I love that personally because I think it echoes Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams, who in his writings refers to God as the creative, sustaining, and transforming power at work in the universe which I love as a definition because it can apply to traditional concepts of God as well as to not any God at all and still work. So I love that about James Luther Adams. And I think of spirituality myself as anything having to do with this sense of creative, sustaining, and transforming power, how we perceive it, how we think about it, how we react to it, how we describe it, how we depict it, and how doing so makes us feel, including how it makes us aware of and in touch with that creative, sustaining, and transforming energy at work in the universe. I think we can also think of spirit as being the spirit within us as embodied creatures, the human spirit. Some people conceive of this as the divine power, the creative, sustaining, transforming power in each one of us, some of this consider in terms of the spirit being the same as one's soul. And I don't believe in that binary of uh, spirit and corporal material stuff. I don't believe humans are Trinitarian any more than God as an idea is Trinitarian. I don't think we have a disembodied soul or spirit in opposition to the material body or physical body. I tend to think in terms of holistic beings. We are creatures of body, mind, and spirit, and it's all intertwined and inseparable. Each working with the other always to constitute a single reality that is us. That said, one of my favorite ways to describe the spirit is from Parker Palmer, who says, the soul or the spirit is what's left when everything else is stripped away. Our emotions, our intellect, our will. When you get rid of all of that, whatever's left is something tenacious that clings to life and seeks out love and understanding and acceptance. As good a definition of soul or the human spirit as I've ever heard. And I know it might seem a little bit contradictory that the human spirit is both what's left when everything is stripped away and at the same time, the sum total of all our parts, body, mind, and spirit, and everything that makes us up. And I know that may not make sense, but given the universe we're in, maybe it does. You cannot square up and completely align Newtonian physics and quantum physics. It doesn't work yet. We're looking for the grand unification theory. So if the physics we know of our real world isn't matched up yet everywhere, I can have spirituality be the sum total of all our parts and what's left when everything's stripped away at the same time. I claim that right. In a sense, it's the way that the color black can be seen as the presence of all colors, right? When my dad was an art teacher, he would show me that you put all the colors on top of each other, you come up with something that looks like black. And yet, black can also be when we have no light, we're left with no photons, and we have dark or black. So it's both the presence of all color and the absence of all color at the same time. Our universe works for my definitions of spirit to work together. And I think the human spirit is that thing in us also that appreciates beauty and loves nature and loves learning and feels love and pain 
and is aware of its existence even to the point of suffering or joy. It's that thing in us that seeks fairness and kindness and compassion and inclusion. I think our spirit is the thing in us that rises in courage and in prayer, in loyalty and in love, and it sits in stillness and pushes our body to extremes of exertion. It's fierce and it's tender, and so are we. In the Varieties of Religious Experience, a book based on a series of lectures he gave in Edinburgh in 1901 and 1902, the American philosopher and psychologist William James describes religion, and I would say he's all just talking about spirituality, as the feelings, acts, and experience of people so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider divine. And I would add, or not divine. I think it all works of a piece. And I think what James describes can certainly apply to spirituality and not just religion, for in his own time, I think the terms were used rather interchangeably in a way they're not necessarily anymore today. And James approaches religious or spiritual experience from relationship to the divine, the holy, the sacred. And I do not believe this precludes atheists or agnostics from such experiences. I believe we can readily substitute that which we consider holy, sacred, of ultimate value and ultimate importance for the divine. My definition of divine might be a little more inclusive than William James was thinking about, but I think it also works in terms of what he says. And he says that a spiritual experience has four characteristics. One is that it's ineffable. It cannot adequately be explained or put into words or defined. So if you're having trouble following me this morning, it's not you, it's the subject matter. It's noetic. A person receives knowledge or insight from the experience that they are otherwise unable to comprehend or understand. And this is only from the perspective of the subject. It's you as the person experiencing something spiritual that receives the knowledge, whether it's true for somebody else or they get or understand what you receive as knowledge or important in any way doesn't matter. That's a subjective experience. Also, he says that the spiritual experience is transient. These experiences are usually fairly short in duration. They don't last a long time. And think about how we term a lot of things like this, a flash of inspiration, a moment of insight, a spark. And I think we're on to what he was talking about. And these experiences are passive. The person receives the experience. They don't cause it and are not in control of it. James notes that visions, voices, emotions, feelings, and ideas are all common ways people experience this. I think the transcendentalist would have liked his language. We may create, for example, a ritual or a ceremony or write down words or music, but the experience is one that's not of our control. We don't frequently say, I'm going to compose a symphony and boom, there it is. We have to sit and kind of work the whole thing out and we get it from some place. I think Winnie the Pooh describes this the best, though. If you've ever read Winnie the Pooh, A.A. A. Milne, speaking through Winnie the Pooh, says, poetry and hums are not things which you get. They are things which get you, and all you can do is go where they can find you. I think William James would have liked that. Some of the more common settings for spiritual experiences are solitude, being by ourselves, in a community, especially in a ritual or ceremonial setting, listening to music. Did y'all know that music, when they study it in brain imaging, when people hear music, it lights up more parts of our brain at once than anything else humans can experience. Did you know this about music? It's amazing when you think of that. No wonder Bach says music is the voice of God. I think it might be more queen than Bach myself, but you know, that's me.
nature is one of the ways we most commonly experience these types of spiritual things. And we know scientifically now that just being in nature, taking the forest bath, right, is good for us physiologically, for our blood pressure, for our sense of calm. We know this. Study is one of the ways we get these experiences. And this can be theology or science. I've had shivers go down my spine in an experience that I would call spiritual, reading a book on mysticism and reading a book on quantum physics. I've had this experience I would call spiritual, watching a candle and incense burn and chanting and meditating, as well as watching Cosmos by Carl Sagan on TV. Spiritual practices are things that enhance our sense of the spirit. They allow us access to this part of ourselves through their dedicated, repetitious involvement. We can make ourselves more aware of and sensitive to this part of ourselves, the spiritual life. Spiritual practices are things done with depth, intention, regularity, and dedication, or some would say consecration to something higher and outside ourselves. They connect us to our deepest sense of true self and to others and to the world around us. They can be individual practices or group practices. Prayer is certainly one of these. So is meditation and journaling and yoga and Tai Chi, but so is reading and walking and journaling and gardening and painting and dancing and even protesting. It's more about how you come to the practice, what you bring to it and what you seek from it rather than the practice itself. Instead of delving into spiritual practices more this morning, it's a topic for sermons and books of its own. There's focus on a couple of the different types or styles or common characteristics various practices have. Spiritual practices in general can be grouped along a continuum. It's not quite a binary because there's crossover and interplay. They're in relationship with each other somewhat. The Christian tradition calls these cataphatic and apophatic. And at first this seems very esoteric, but as I explain a little more, I think you see that it does have its practical uses. <clears throat> And sometimes spiritual practices can combine both of these things. Cataphatic spirituality has content. It deals in words and images and symbols, ideas, music and movement. It's about representing and communicating the divine or God. Apophatic spirituality has no content. It means emptying and experience the divine through what is not there. In Buddhism, it would be called something like the path of no self. There's nothing there. Zen meditation is apophatic. Some particular practices such as meditation can be either. Zen meditation or Christian centering prayer is certainly apophatic. But if you sit and breathe along to somebody speaking and do a guided meditation, that has content. That's a cataphatic practice. Cataphatic practices are about the divine's presence and apophatic about the divine's absence. An atheist practicing breath meditation is an apophatic practice, whether or not there's divinity associated to it or not. For the human spirit, it applies the same way, apophatic and cataphatic. Any apophatic and cataphatic practice can also be on an active contemplative spectrum. Apophatic practices in their emptying and nothingness are certainly contemplative, but even cataphatic practices can be very contemplative. Practices such as reading, study, walking meditation, chanting, singing, journaling, yoga, and Tai Chi are cataphatic, but they are also very contemplative. Active practices can include things like dancing and singing and protesting or social justice advocacy. And the active and contemplative ends of the spectrum work together in relationship and complement each other. An active practice such as gardening or protesting 
becomes a very spiritual practice when it's combined with contemplative practice, with thinking about it, writing about it, journaling about it. Active contemplative. It's a cycle and a relationship that both ends of the spectrum meet and work together. Spirituality and things of the spirit and the spiritual life are often talked about in terms of being a journey. In her book, Mysticism, Evelyn Underhill says mysticism is the innate tendency of the human spirit towards the complete harmony with the transcendental order, whatever the theological formula under which the order is understood. This tendency in great mystics gradually captures the whole field of consciousness. It dominates their life and in the experience called mystic union atten attains its end. In the Christian tradition, this journey is made through three linear stages called purgation, illumination, and union. Purgation is a leaving behind, dropping all the stuff that's baggage, getting in the way of your journey. Illumination is the period of learning, and union is that sense of being at one with the sacred and God. Um, nirvana would be a sense of that end part and journey in a different tradition. However, there's another way to approach this that's become very popular in the last 40, 50 years. In his book, Original Blessing, Matthew Fox reimagines the mystic journey into four paths. He calls the via positiva, the via negativa, the via creativa, and the via transformativa. And unlike the other paths in traditional mysticism, these four paths are not linear and we travel at different ways and for different time periods on them and jump around between them and sometimes do two or three or all four together. Which seems to me to correlate more to my own personal experience than that linear path does. Again, all this stuff I'm saying this morning is just barely scratching the surface away of huge topics that people have indeed written many books about and can be the topics of many different sermons all on their own. But I hope what I've said this morning has helped at least a little bit understand what we mean when we talk about spirit and spirituality. Part of what is so wondrous about the life of the spirit for me is that it is ineffable. It is frequently hard to put into words. No matter how many words I've used this morning, have I completely nailed it? No, not even close. It's really difficult to put this stuff into words we understand, especially because our individual experiences can be so different. So I want to end with one of my favorite explanations of the spiritual. And this comes from Dag Hammarskjöld, who was a Swedish politician and was Secretary General of the United Nations from 1953 to 61, and after his death was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. He says, I don't know who or what put the question. I don't know when it was put. I don't even remember answering. But at some moment, I did answer yes to someone or something. And from that hour, I was certain that existence is meaningful. And therefore, my life in self-surrender had a purpose and a goal. That resonates with me. I hope it resonates with you. Thanks a lot for watching this video. It would help me out a great deal if you like the video to give it a big thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share this video with others, maybe ring that notification bell so you can be informed when we put out other videos like this. Check out my website and blog at TonyLorenzen.com for even more resources that will open your mind, touch your heart, and inspire your spirit.